tuned out too and didn't like it. You're not in this alone. With Dale said and I thought he was biased. Then I got a memo that said copy the finest. Before my foolishness settled in. Recorded the whole tape before we got to Berlin. This close to giving up and now never again. Don't overlook the work and come expecting a win. In the end, my word, never put nothing over the squad. Got it right up under their nose with your fighter facade. Off the cliff of broken wings, I'm aware of the odds. Enough faith for us all, I'm the one for the job. Most days, catching sun rays, baby, look like the front page. Overthinking what they might say, have it your way, yeah. The biggest threat is something they never seen. Dial it up, patch me into the screen. I had them all nine before I dial up. How they claiming they on top when I'm a mile up. I had them all nine before I dial up. How they claiming they on top when I'm a mile up. Closing in, but don't you dare give up now. Hope believe, then me pull up through some bucks down. Tied till the valet pull the truck. What's going on, everybody in Lukeman Nation? I am Jackie Lukeman, and welcome to another episode of Live in Coffee Current Events and Politics in Lukeman Nation, the most dangerous show on social media anywhere. Appreciate y'all so much. Uh, you have. Uh, uh, <laughs> I hate it when I start a show and the phone rings and then it distracts me, it drives me nuts. But anyway, you all have been really great. Appreciate your support. Um, if you are a patron, thank you so much for your support through Patreon. But if you're not a patron and you like what you see and you hear in Luke Mon Nation, please consider becoming a Patreon, uh, three, five, seven dollars a month or more if you can swing it. But you know, we will accept any support that we uh, um, that you wish to give us. We really appreciate it. And it is put to good use. So you can find us on patreon.com slash Lukeman Nation, L-U-Q-M-A-N-N-A-T-I-O-N. As always, you can follow us on uh, Twitter, Lukeman Nation, the number one, no space. Uh, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us. Please subscribe on YouTube and share this video, share this video because I've been waiting to have this conversation for a week. I've been waiting. I've been watching these sisters post all kinds of just deep cutting, just slashing analysis of this whole capital riot foolishness. And let's not waste any more time on me and my stuff. Let's bring our guests in, uh, Erica Keynes, uh, and uh, Onya Sonyu Chatoya, Erica is uh, with Hood Communist, uh, a blog, a publication that if you're not reading it, there's something wrong with your analysis. There are two, I think, critical publications um, that I know have been really edifying for me and Mr. Lukeman. One of them is Black Agenda Report and another one, which is a year old, just past your year anniversary, Hood Communist, amazing, amazing work. Um, and Onya Sonyu Chatoya is a member of the All African Revolutionary People's Party. Um, if you don't know what AARPR is, then you really don't know the history of revol revolutionary people. Um, but I'm gonna let you ladies explain what your organizations and your work is before we get into uh, the analysis of this whole thing. So Erica, let's start with you. Tell us about yourself, Hood Communist, and what you do. 
Yeah, I want to also say Onye is a co-editor of Hood Communists That's as well. Right. Um, Onye, uh, Ghazi, Kozo, uh, and then we just uh, have two new editors. Uh, Mac is in the chat. Hey, Mac, and uh, Ajama Umi, who is a long-standing member of the All-African People Revolutionary Party. Um, so, you know, so 2021 is going to be more of that sharp analysis uh, with them added on. Um, yeah. But yeah, but uh, we always credit that analysis to organizations. Um, to our credit, each uh, editor um, is a member of organization. I am a member of the Black Alliance for Peace and also uh, Eugenia's People's Progress Party here in Maryland, uh, which is an independent uh, Black workers political party. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and then I'm also the founder of Liberation Through Reading, uh, which is a, a gifting uh, program for Black children. So we gift uh, for free uh, Black books written by Black authors uh, based on Black children um, and have gifted over 2,000. So yeah, that is, yeah, in multiple cities, in, in Brooklyn, New York, Philadelphia, um, Baltimore, and then in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. So that is me. <laughs> uh, and Anya, if you want to go ahead. Yep, please. Thank you. Um, it's a little bit choppy for me, so I'm not sure if it's on my end. But if I am having connection issues, just let me know and I'll see if I can resolve. But hi, my name is Onya Sanu. I am a cadre with the All African People's Revolutionary Party, also editor with Hood Communist. We founded it together, myself, Erica, and Ghazi. Uh, and then also on the National Coordinating Committee of the Ben Samos Brigade, which is a solidarity delegation to Cuba. And yeah, exactly what Erica said, like revolutionary organization is the key. Revolutionary organization is why our analysis is all on point, because we are a revolutionary African organization with systematic political education processes, which allow us to observe what's happening in the snake right now <laughs> and critically analyze it put in its proper historical context. Which I deeply Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really I really am excited to have both of you on tonight. And I really appreciate um the analysis that you've given because I, I'm I want to make one thing really clear for people who who because I mean, I guess I'm still like surrounded. I think like most of us are like not everybody in our family is like where we are with, you know, politics and, and analysis and that kind of stuff. And, you know, that kind of drives me a little nuts. But you, know, you got to let people get to where they are on their own. Um, but, you know, people are, are, are constantly criticizing me about, you know, well, you know, not everybody sees things the way you do. That's true. And I have to remember, like. Uh, Kwame Torres said that, you know, there was a time that I didn't know what I know now, you know, and I have to keep in mind that there are a lot of people that I'm surrounded by who do not know what I know now. But the reason I know the things I do now is that I did listen to people like Kwame Torres. Thank God for YouTube and somebody recorded those speeches that man did uh, that, you know, i didn't know about when I was, you know, that age when he was still alive and all and doing lectures. Um, but my mom talked about him, but only because he was handsome. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think she went to see like one of his speeches and she's like, I like what he says, but you know what? That man is fine. <laughs> so that's that was like my um in my youth, my whole introduction to like revolutionary speakers like revolutionary thought and radical thought you know my mom uh you know i ate at a black panther school during the summer uh one year here in dc uh, i knew about them but we were not immersed in that um so my education came way later in life way after high school way after you know like two years of college and it was actually in college that i was introduced to cr clr james and read the Black Jacobins, <laughs> my, had my mind blown. And, you know, that's where that all came from. But my my re most recent, I think, um, um, uh, sharpening, I think, came from joining an organization, joining Black, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Black Alliance for Peace uh, a few years ago. Um, you know, being 
involved in progressive politics, but then seeing the failure of progressive politics to address issues seriously, address issue, issues of white supremacy and racial capitalism, and not just capitalism in a general sense, but you know, all of the, what I saw from the progressive movement was a very kind of catch all kind of thing where general policies are gonna fix all the people's problems and nobody wanted to talk about how different things affect different people um, and the nuances of the different kinds of oppression that people face. So, you know, getting connected with people like Ajamu Baraka, who I actually met because I interviewed him for an outlet that I was working with and I knew who he was. And I was like, oh my God, I'm interviewing Ajamu Baraka. And, you know, having conversations with this dude, just realizing that he was willing to have conversation with us. And he was always excited to, to talk to us. So for, for us, having the kind of access to people with radical ideology, with serious um, uh, critical analysis of different levels of this system who are also accessible and who don't put themselves on like this pedestal and always like made us feel not just welcome, but also like didn't make us feel foolish because we didn't get it completely or that we didn't, un or that we didn't agree with a certain thing. And, and, you know, that led me to, I think, um, be what, you know, where I am now, which is, you know, a Marxist socialist, Christian, Pan-Africanist, internationalist, I'm real clear on that shit. And that's why. So I, I have been watching Erica and Anya, the, um, the fallout of the events last Wednesday. And from one perspective, like from just the basic, oh my God, this is something that people haven't ever seen before, in, you know, in this country, I guess. Um, I understand that people are shocked and taken aback and all that kind of stuff. But if they had listened to people who have a different analysis of this system, None of this would have been a surprise. Not any of it would have, would the, if, if they were like we are, they would have been sitting there looking at their watch like any day now, any day now, this shit is going to explode. So I, I'm just going to ask the both of you to weigh in on your initial thoughts when you saw it happen, as you saw it unfolding. What were your thoughts as you were watching like the footage unfolding and you know, the, 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 the rally devolve into the riot or insurrection or whatever it was. Let me start with you, Anya. That's like second on the roof was my first reaction. I was like, oh, look at this. <laughs> A crowd of reactionary, racist, petty bourgeois men tearing shit up. But, it, oh, excuse me, I'm not even telling this. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, this this is this is this is a free expression zone. <laughs> okay. That's all I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> Racist European petty bourgeois men tearing shit up. I was like, oh, look at this thing happening in Washington D.C. It's precisely what Washington D.C. has done in Brazil and Honduras and Haiti. Like it's place after place after place. And I was like, this is chickens coming home to roost. This is what happens when you sow discord and reaction and white supremacy around the world. You apply it through violence, the same people are going to come back here and do the same thing. And U.S. Americans, U.S. citizens were forced to deal with the reality of their government's actions around the world, except this time it was in the belly of the beast. So it was the chickens coming home to roost for me. I laughed a lot that day. Yeah. <laughs> so, Erica, what about you? I, I, I made an adjustment to the uh, audio, so I hope that helps a little bit. Erica, what about you? Where were your... What were your thoughts as you were watching this unfold? Yeah, well, I didn't actually uh, see it unfold because I intentionally try to avoid uh, my mother watching MSNBC. <laughs> so I seen it at the, um, I seen it just as they were starting to walk in to the building. So I was able to hear like Todd and, and Nicole Wallace, whose voice I can't 
tape. Um, <laughs> um, I was hearing them way in. Um, so my initial reaction was like hearing them say, like they were literally using the words Banana Republic. So I was like, oh wow. So they're just letting racism just fly on, on mainstream media. Um, so that was more of my reaction, um, you know, just the this sort of apathy against the chicken coming home to roost. Um, and even as they're, the, everyone's watching it unfold live in real time, and their reaction is not even any sort of self-criticism, but just a, this isn't supposed to happen here. This is, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're on live TV acknowledging this is what we do everywhere else. Like, this happens to other places. To Banana Republic, you know, but no one on the panel is saying, "Well, what do you mean, Banana Republic? Like, what's that about? Talk about that." Like, you know, no, they're just gonna say Banana Republic and, and keep it moving. So my reaction yeah. is like, "Oh, okay, so racism is just a okay on mainstream media." <laughs> You know, yeah, my Trumps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let, let's let's dig into that for a minute because I heard that a couple of times, and you know, because I, I because of my day job, which I swear I I, I keep I keep pinching myself because it's like this can't really be my job, but it is. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, I'm on uh, by any means necessary. I'm a co-host on by any means necessary on Radio Sputnik every day, five days a week with Sean Blackman, dope ass young brother. Um, he's not that young. He keeps reminding me he's not that young. I just am older than he is. So I can say that. Um, but, um, you know, so I, I have to kind of watch corporate news to analyze what it is they're saying, what it is they're not saying, um, and how important leave what they leave out is to, um, you know, this radical struggle for liberation that we're per perpetually in. And it blew my mind when people were like, oh, this is the kind of thing I see in Banana Republics. And I'm like, do you bastards not know what that means? Do you, do you not know where that comes from? So what is a Banana Republic? Where does it come from? And, and why is it such a racist, disgusting term to use and just throw around kind of flippantly? Either one of you. So I actually come from a banana republic. My family is from, well, the, the boat dropped us off in Haiti and dropped us off in Honduras. Mm. Honduras is one of the most famous examples. Honduras, alongside Guatemala, was basically run as like a vassal state of the Chiquita Banana Company. At the time, it was called the United Fruit Company. And what that looked like was that the United Fruit Company, working in collaboration with the U.S. government, deliberately destabilized conditions in Honduras through mass violence, through massacres. Um, through attempting to control the government and successfully cooling the government several times. So the a whole concept of a banana republic is a completely imperialist creation. It's not because those nations just can't get it together, those brown people can't govern themselves, it's because they were being messed with in extremely violent ways. But the way that it's used in the U.S. media is completely out of context. And that history is hidden from U.S. citizens, and they just like repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Banana Republic, like that's something the U.S. United States government made up alongside private corporations. It's really bananas. Bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the whole thing behind uh, the, the phrase Banana Republic, and this is where I, I feel like it, it's racist because it's never done to countries that are not full of brown, black and brown folks that the United States or its allies or its imperialist uh, 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 compatriots, the UK, uh, Spain, or, or wherever, um, has not wanted to exploit those people in order to steal their resources. So the, just the term banana comes from the fact that this whole, I mean, the, 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 the United Fruit Company was basically they supplanted the government of places like Honduras and, and Haiti and, and other places, and the, they became the government. So, I mean, this literal fruit company, the banana people, over they fomented a coup in these places where they wanted to install plantations to exploit the labor of the people in these places so that they could force them to work and harvest all these bananas and other fruits. This is, and, and as much as I love bananas, I swear, when I learned this history, I really started to be like, I don't think I can ever eat another banana because 
that's where the Chiquita Banana Company comes from. Yeah, and also, um, it's it's ongoing resistance against Chiquita Banana. Like currently, they're blocking people on social media who even um, challenge or speak out or highlight um, the ongoing uh, struggle that's been going on. So there's a whole boycott uh, Chiquita Banana currently going on um, that I just recently saw this week. Um, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yes, there's an ongoing struggle as they're like continuing to talk about it. Um, but again, they're able to brush that over because, you know, um, that happens out there and it has nothing to do with here. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess that's a lot of my issue with the reaction, um, how people be, have been reacting, um, especially with, with terms like imperialism. Mm -hmm. because I think people think like it's like a buzzword now or like it's a new trendy thing and not an actual like concept and an actual like you know that's what's actually happening um and how it affects us here so yeah so I just wanted to make that point yeah I mean because when when I when I listen to well I can't listen to Chris Matthews that I can't I can't do it sorry or Rachel Maddow I, to, I really can't listen to her <laughs> But when I listen to like Joe Scarborough, I can tolerate him for a good 45 minutes. Um, or or uh, um, what's the dude on CNN, Cuomo or, you know, Wolf Blitzer or any of those folks, they, uh, they, they have been consistent in saying things like, this is the kind of thing I see in, um, <clears throat> in Nicaragua. You know, these kinds of things happen in Honduras. You know, this is the kind of thing that happens in Bolivia, but, and they leave it right there. They'll say that and they'll leave it right there. Like even today, when they were talking about all of the troops, like 25,000 U.S. troops are stationed around, not just around the Capitol building, we're going to get to that later, um, not just around the Capitol, but like the entire downtown D.C. area is shut down. You cannot go in there. You cannot go out. And somebody, you know, all day, all day long on CNN, they've been talking about, well, this looks like the green zone in Iraq. And they never make the connection between what the United States has done in those countries to make them, to cause them to make the reference of, well, this is what it looks like in that country. It, so that they are referencing U.S. imperialism without explaining what U.S. imperialism has done in those countries. And it's crazy because somebody like passed around this, uh, I saw a, a meme where somebody said because of the travel restrictions, uh, U.S. had to um, implement a coup right here in the United States because we couldn't you know, implement one in another country. Well, that's not true. You know, because we we definitely this not we this government has definitely been um, involved in other countries and uh, fomenting unrest and insurrection and coups in other countries. COVID be damned, because um, you know money doesn't know borders. But you know, so so that that was like one aspect of the coverage that I'm so glad that that you guys uh, raised. And I think the other aspect that I thought that was was interesting that we had internal discussions about, we meaning like members of Black Alliance for Peace and, and other organizations about what to call this. Like, is it a coup? Is it an insurrection? Is it a riot? Why isn't it one thing or another? Anya, my perspective is that at this point, I don't think it's, it's as important what we call it as long as we get the analysis right as, in regard to what it is for us. But on the other hand, I feel like we do have to be clear on the difference between a coup and an insurrection and why that does kind of matter um, in, in, in this discussion. But I don't know, what are you, what are you, what, what, what were your thoughts on that? I mean, it's directly related to what we were just talking about, right? Where like the term banana republic is invoked, but the history of U.S. imperialism that produced that term is erased, is not part of the conversation. And so people in the United States have no concept of the fact that their government with their tax dollars is constantly cooing other countries, constantly. Like as soon as the government gets into power, 
that is not going to move when the U.S. government wants, especially when it comes to exploiting resources, land, or labor, the U.S. government deliberately overthrows that government. That happens constantly. And so when I saw that, I, like I come from a place, two places, Haiti and Honduras, are constantly sued by the U.S. government. Um, so when I saw that term invoked, particularly because those people had no chance of ever seizing state power. Like, you cannot seize state power in the United States by seizing Congress. Like, it's just not going to work. Um, so, so the fact that that was just never, ever going to be an outcome, and people were invoking that term, to me, was a clear indication that people don't understand what it is, and they also don't understand the government is doing it. Um, but beyond that, when I saw, you know, regular people saying coup, but then I also saw Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, Ooh, a, yeah. sort of members of the U.S. security state using the same term. I was like, they're doing, trying to do a particular thing with this language. They're trying to provoke a particular response that's going to rationalize oppression, that's going to rationalize surveillance, that's going to rationalize so-called counterterrorism laws that are going to target people like us. So when I saw first that it was not like, just like definition speaking, it was not a cue, but also that the U.S. ruling class and security state were united in describing it in this particular way. I'm like, where? who was the first person to call it this? I am very suspicious because <laughs> the way this is unfolding is very problematic. So I do think that the language matters because what we're seeing happen right now is the, the building of a bipartisan consensus for something like a, what people are calling like a Patriot Act 2.0 that, again, is going to target people like us. I mean, I, I, I want to stay on there for a second because Erica, like when I, and, and I tried to kind of have conversations with people about like, okay, this is why this is not a coup. Because those people rolling up into the Capitol building, I don't care how freaked out the, the legislators were in the building, nobody's power was being taken away that day by those people. They, they were not going to go in there and stop any process that would overturn the government, that they weren't seizing control of this government. That was not going to happen. But then when I saw, you know, like Anya said, Nancy Pelosi and, you know, the, um, uh, the former director of Homeland Security or some, you know, bullshit like that come out and they're using that language. And I'm like, y'all know what a coup is. Cause you know, you do them. <laughs> so, so what are you up to? So, I mean, I, I want to talk for a minute, Erica, about this, this bipartisan support for the security state that is, is coalescing. Well, it's coalesced now, basically. Yeah. And, and what that's going to mean for us, because a weird thing happened where people were like, yeah, the typical liberals were like, yeah, the FBI, they need to get those people. <laughs> but then I saw folks who thought I thought were kind of radical, like cheering on the FBI. And I mean, what what does that mean for us when we're talking about this bipartisan coalition of this new I'm calling it like, um, you know, the Patriot Act point, you know, five point oh. <laughs> this point. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think that I always try to uh, to make that point about the ways that people are walk into specific narratives uh, without being critical of those narratives. Um, and we've seen the same support. Uh, of, well, it's always been a galvanizing of support behind the FBI in the last four years um, because of Trump. Uh, and we're seeing it again, Trump being used as a reason to further uh, support the FBI. Um, but yeah, it's it, 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 I, the other day, I think it was yesterday, made a year since uh, Moms for Housing, since that since they were removed from, um, from that vacant home with the use of militarized policing. Um, we're coming from an entire uprising where there were <laughs> for the fund of police, community control of police, um, these different aspects um, of being very, very critical of policing. And all the while, um, Joe Biden has very, been very adamant that he's not listening to any of it. And in fact, we'll just put in 300 million more, right? So now, as we're seeing all of this unfold and people are getting behind the idea of, of yeah, police are, you know, we need police because look at what they're doing. We need mm -hmm. 
Look at the white supremacists. We need to be cracking down on them without even being critical or analyzing the ways that it's continuously cracked down on us. Um, the question I've been raising actually around that has been the first hundred days that Biden's prioritizing has nothing to do with housing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with housing. And we've seen how they handle evictions across the country, we have been seeing it. Um, and Moms for Housing was before COVID. So that was already the standard. So what do we think is gonna happen now? What's gonna be the backlash? Right. And nobody's being critical of that because they're like being walked into a specific narrative of this is why this would be okay without ever thinking about, you know, the aftermath or the, you know, but I think that's the same thing around the conversations around censorship, right? Where people are like trying to box that directly into like a, a freedom of speech conversation, but it's not a freedom of speech discourse, right? Because we're not the ones really running the narrative of censorship. Even if we're saying that we have to force these private entities in, they're not doing it on behalf of the people. Like, right, right, right. Our workers, you know, the people don't own the means. So they're not doing these things on behalf of us. And I think that we have to be very clear about that because they can remove one white supremacist and 200 of us will be removed the exact same day. And, mm -hmm. and nobody can make a peep about it. And, and also the people who are also being like critical say, well, this ha these are the things that always happen to the left, right? But why y'all, I don't understand that logic of saying that or making that argument that this has always happened to the left if you're not going to fight against that. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. What are you doing? Well, <laughs> are you that's kind of blown crazy? my mind. <laughs> the past couple of days, like over the issue with Trump and, you know, being deplatformed. And, you know, some of the same people who poo-pooed black activists, black radicals, you know, communists, socialists, whomever, who, who, was, who were critical of of folks from the left being deplatformed. These are the same people who are like, oh my God, it's so wrong that Trump was deplatformed. That's just for the violation of freedom of speech. But y'all didn't care when my profile got yanked twice. <laughs> you know, when people we know got banned for, you know, for however many days on social media because they pissed off some white person. And it's that easy for a white person to just you know, report somebody's post and say that, well, they offended me. And then all of a sudden we violated community standards, but actual fascists can, you know, post stuff on there just and, and not face any repercussions. And that's not, that has not been an ongoing conversation and fight in holding these, yes, they're private entities and it's their platforms. And yeah, we signed the user agreement, but still, they can't make profits without users. So, I mean, at, at what point are we going to understand that even though they're private companies, we do have power as users? Um, but yeah, that, that was a really interesting, weird yeah. kind of like... And then also well, what does it look like in the context of, of Sesta Foster that nobody really speaks about that has stripped so much so much of our rights away or the Earn It app that's like on the horizon <laughs> that nobody's really like. And then what does that even sound like when we see Julian Assange, that case not even really, really having any real waves in within the movement? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that everything that I've seen thus far has been just reactionary responses to something that, again, people are expecting to see happen to others and not us. Mm-hmm. Anya, you have, you, have so, you have something to input? Yeah, I just think that these companies have been basically handed control over a remarkable amount of speech because, yes, while they are private companies, they're also a lot of people's primary source of news. A lot of people, certainly during the COVID-19 pandemic, primary source of connecting with others. And so, like, a lot of speech, a lot of thought is on these platforms, and these companies have almost unilateral control mm -hmm. over what speech is allowed. Like, I just, right before I got on the show, a comrade was like, took away my ability to make events and groups, just, like, unilaterally, with no reason. And this is, like, an organizer. So this is the kind of power that they have. And, like, people are just, like, I've seen, like, a lot of folks be like, you know, well, it's a private company, they can do what they want. Or, you know, like not understanding um, that the, the banning of Trump is like the latest in a series of situations where these companies are deciding who can and cannot say what on those platforms. And they should not have those, that power. 
But because people are so used to it, because they've been taught not to question it, I feel like it's just like escalating to the point where all of us are going to be chased off of Facebook ultimately. We're going to be chased off of Twitter. We're going to be chased off of YouTube. And people are not going to challenge it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Time. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, I think I see that. And, 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 I, and I'm looking at the way the right flocked to Parler. And then when Parler was kicked off of Amazon's uh, web hosting platform, And that's a whole nother conversation right there. People do not understand how deeply embedded into everything uh, code related Amazon web services is connected to. I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's horrifying how little we understand how critical Amazon web services is as a, most people don't even know what Amazon Web Services is. Um, but if you've ever worked in any kind of like, if you've ever worked for any agency, state or federal agency, I can almost guarantee you that every platform they have is hosted by Amazon Web Services. Every single thing. They're everywhere. Um, and, and but even though parlor that that's a I went off on a tangent but that's that's probably a conversation we really really need to have about mm-hmm. who who controls technology right who controls the public technology uh space that isn't really public and we don't know we don't understand how public it really is not right. um but these folks went from parlor that got kicked off of Amazon web services and who knows where they've gone to now, but I bet you they found another outlet to congregate yeah. on. And and I mean, why do you all think it has been so difficult for those of us on the so-called left to do that kind of thing? Because I, 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 I keep getting the feeling that the right is, they're just kind of better organized than we are in some regards for all the wrong reasons. And I'm wondering if you all feel the same way that, Part of the reason this happened last Wednesday was that these mugs been organized, organizing like a son of a bitch for years. And just that, that they've been organizing around the most ridiculous ideas, but they've always been organ- organizing around this ideology that they are being denied something, something's being taken away from them, they're aggrieved, they're angry, and they have to protect themselves in, pre- in preparation for you know, this great cataclysm to come um, where I'm not sure that at least on the progressive ish left um, that I, I'm not even sure people know what the heck they're, they're organizing around. And, yeah. and, but that's just my opinion. What do you all think? Well, I think, I think for one, like if we, if we step back and just analyze the, the class of the people who were in attendance of the right, right? It was a mixed bag. So we, we we're talking about lawyers and doctors and and all. You know, a lady took a jet there. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know. So when we so for me, um, I think that we have to be realistic about who owns these entities that that yeah. we can tap into. Right? They're not, as we could see, they're the they're hidden racist or you know on the, on the surface or they might be liberals <laughs> but you know <laughs> but but at the end of the day we don't have you know it's the ownership i think that that has a lot to do to do with that um even with with amazon removing them from parlor amazon is still working for the state <laughs> it's not like they removed their connections with the state um so that's so that's my criticism with the with the new union workers from that they wouldn't that they would attack the censorship issue, mm-hmm. but Google's still tied to the state. <laughs> right. You know, right. they're still tied to surveillance and they're still tied to the military industrial complex. And so is Amazon. And, and there's a fixation on censorship and, and who's getting censored. The people who call out that Amazon and Google are tied to the state. Like <laughs> those are the people who are, who are mostly getting censored. Um, so yeah, so it's just a, a a walking and a funneling into a narrative, but I, I for sure think that there needs to be a deeper conversation about ownership and the means of production, um, because I do think that we all we always sort of do that. Well, we could build our own, right? 
It's the same thing with, with black businesses, right? We could just do, do our own thing without really analyzing, well, who truly owns what we're trying to establish upon, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, who are the gatekeepers that yeah. would have to, you know, that we whose whose check boxes we have to go through for all kinds of, you know, access and and certification and and legal, you know, bullshit that are just as connected to the state as the people who we're trying to get away from. And if that's true, how can we really build our own? Yeah, that's definitely a conversation that we need to have. But you you said something, Erica, that Anya, I wanted to pick up on um, the whole class character of these people. Now, I'm from a small town in Virginia, a little town called Jarrett, Virginia, 90 miles south of Richmond. I know a hick when I see one because plenty of my own cousins, they hicks. They, I got people in my family who still shoot squirrel, okay, and eat them and you know, don't knock it till you tried it. That's why Southerners created gravy. We we understand that we need to eat some stuff that, you know, times was hard. But so I'm looking at this crowd and I'm like, these people are not like a bunch of poor hicks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're just not. Especially if, you know, people who don't live in D.C., Anya, and they don't know, um, what DC is like. They don't know what the cost of living is here. They don't know that like the holiday in downtown is like $200 a night. <laughs> and, and that's off season, right? That's only because it's winter time and maybe it's COVID, you know? Um, so these people have filled up all of the hotels. Somebody did a video where they were, they were like in the Hyatt, in the Washington Hyatt. And they're full of Trump supporters, full of these people. And I'm like, these folks ain't broke. What are you, what are you talking about? And these people are like, oh, all these poor Trump supporters who don't realize that, you know, he lied to the but but most of those people were not broke. So, so I mean, that's my perspective, Anya. What are people missing about the class character of these folks who stormed the Capitol? No. Um, I think that you and Erica are absolutely right. They were petty bourgeois. They were so-called middle-class people. They were small business owners. Um, they were people who, after nine months of COVID-19, where like millions have been out of work and not be able to have a consistent income, these are people that could take like a flight on a week's notice to Washington, D.C. to like turn up. So very clearly, these are not struggling people. These are not poor people. These are not even necessarily working class people. These are petty bourgeois, and that has always been the base of fascism. Like, that's who that is. Especially in the United States, the Stellar Colonial Project, like, they were the main managers of it. So that is very, the way that people have attempted to decontextualize Trump or make Trump a solely, like, economic phenomenon while ignoring the fundamental nature of his base, like, the petty bourgeois nature of his base, um, has been really interesting to observe. It's like people don't actually want to deal with who actually holds economic power in the United States and what they are doing to maintain that power. Yeah, Erica, what did you think? No, I agree. I agree. Um, and then also, like, I, I have my own thoughts about whiteness itself being a class issue. <laughs> yeah, come on. Let's hear it. So, um, yeah. So, no, I mean, that's that's basically it. Like, you know, working through that, or, you know, trying to trying to analyze that. Um, but just based on what we've seen. But I think that it, it benefits them. I mean, we, we see Nancy Pelosi now using whiteness, right? The terminology, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? When, 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 um, you know, when she fought so hard as an Italian, she was so, <laughs> as an Italian American, she was so, perfect. so, so aggrieved, so, <laughs> so oppressed, so like, deeply oppressed. Um, yeah. But, but they do that to distinguish themselves away from it or the ways that they are, they contribute to it, that they are responsible for much of it. Um, you know, they, they allowed so, so much to go on. And, and the two impeachments have a lot to do with, um, you know, exposing the state, not really anything that he's actually done, um, but things that ha that involve exposing the state, which is, um, you know, the, the, Hunt the Hunter Biden incident uh, with Ukraine, which wasn't not true <laughs> about Hunter Biden. Um, 
But you know, that's not a here nor there. He's impeached, right? And then he got impeached again. And then to hear people say that, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, the worst moment in American history, which is like, you know, <laughs> you sure? That's right. It's like, really? <laughs> so yeah. um, so you know, no man, no moment worse than this, really? Oh, right. okay. <laughs> that goes back to to the to the misunderstanding of, of the role that America plays because when they keep quoting Ronald Reagan, <laughs> they keep quoting him. Um, you know, the shining light on the hill. Um, you know, oh no, America's no longer the shining light on the hill. Like, what is that supposed to mean when you're quoting a man whose administration is responsible for so much of what you are deciding is it is not a clue that you are paying attention to or willing to pay attention to. So it's 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 a mess. Um it's a it's a it's a big mess, but I think that that's how that liberalism is is largely responsible for for the nonsense. The Democratic Party hid their head in the sand and attacked like you know surface level bullshit <laughs> around <laughs> Trump, um, and they used Trump as as cover to not really do anything. They didn't do anything, and mm -hmm. they're continuing to use Trump as cover. I mean, that little incident, January 6th, is mu as much of a benefit to them as it was, you know, a terrifying moment um, because they're going to capitalize off of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I noticed over here in the chat that uh, Dr. Ball, what's up, Dr. Ball, said, uh, Erica, please share your works you're using to struggle around whiteness as class. And I think that's really, really important. Um, that we do share like the kind of information that we use to help us um, parse through these issues. Um, so what what books are you reading to to kind of deal with that issue as whiteness as a, as a class issue? Well, I've been, um, people always say like read settlers, right? <laughs> but yeah, I think that you should. I think that that's a great book that that really um, has me, has me sort of re, I don't want to say re-envisioning, but re-analyzing the way uh, whiteness uh, sort of groups in together. Um, and then the works about, you know, the, the labor movement and, and how that all fell apart. Um, because whiteness groups in together, even when it's not its be in its best interest. Um, so yeah, so those are just like, at the moment sort of things that I'm playing with. But for me, I've always kind of stepped back to see like, you know, that whiteness is itself. It's a sort of class issue, especially uh, in assistance to you know colonized communities. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because <laughs> see, I'm, I'm I'm reading the comments over here, and I don't know if you guys can if you guys can see the comments, but I read the comments, and see, I, I'm I'm a Southern girl. I don't care that I'm 53 years old. I still call my daddy sir. I still call my you know my mother in law. I call her ma'am. I, you know, it does not matter that I am grown as fuck. I call these people, sir and ma'am. And, and, and when people achieve uh, uh, an academic accomplishment, I call them by the degree to which they have achieved. So I have called Dr. Ball, Dr. Ball, ever since I've known this man for it's been like, I don't know how many years now. Um, but he just, he just typed in the comment, but please, Jared, <laughs> And that, that is just such, you know, for me to call him by his first name is just so outside of my, I hear my grandma in the back of my head, like, you call that man doctor because he worked for that degree. <laughs> but yes, you, yes, brother, we, uh, we appreciate you a lot. Um, Can I add something really quick on the question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so definitely read Settlers. And the reason why Settlers is a really important book particularly for colonized and African people living in the snakes, is because it's a historical materialist analysis of the development of settler colonialism. And it doesn't just talk about whiteness. It talks about how the identity of whiteness was a construction of European settler colonialism. To understand what happened in Washington, D.C., you have to understand settler colonialism. And one of like the massive limitations of the U.S. left is like completely ignoring the question of the fact of the foundation of this country was stealing indigenous people's land, was attempting to kill them off, was enslaving African people in the colonization of Africa. And the construction of this white identity was a product of colonialism. And then two other books, I always like recommend these books in like a in a group because I feel like they work really well together. So Settlers by Jason Kai, an indigenous people's history of the United States by mm -hmm. Roxanne Dyer, because it talks about the the political and military leadership of the European settler bourgeois 
but also about how the colonization of the United States was a cross-class project, including all like working-class settlers, petty bourgeois settlers, ruling-class settlers. And then the last book to understand this in a global context is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Because oh, you understand yeah. when you read that yeah. book, precisely what they did develop a constructed white identity based on colonialism here, they did in Africa too. So yeah. I got to those books to understand what Eric is talking about. Yeah, well, I, I, I had to replace my copy and I thought it was down here, but it must be upstairs. I, I have this little like um, pile of books that I, I try to read 10 pages a day of of books because otherwise I, I would just never, I get overwhelmed with all the books I want to read. So that's why, that's how I have to do it. Um, that's just, just a suggestion because the, the, the we, we don't, we don't come to our analyses by, you know, by osmosis, we read, we study, you know, you, you study fast and train. That's, there's a reason that, that George Jackson gave us that mantra. Um, and, and it is, it is a mantra that we, we do live by. Now, this, this is what I was thinking as I was watching these people tear up the U.S. Capitol, aside from um, the fact that I personally didn't care and I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> You know, I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just watching them go in and, and I, and I was actually kind of hoping for really, I was hoping for a lot more destruction. I thought they were kind of amateurish with it. And, but, but, but I think that speaks to their class character in that they hold these statues and, and, and the symbolism of the U S Capitol, those things are important to them because they are the petit bourgeois class that are angry because the government didn't do anything, um, largely because of COVID, but not for the same reasons we're angry that the government didn't do anything right. Like they're, <clears throat> the petit bourgeois class, the government had to lock down, you know, shut businesses down, close society down to keep people from uh, spreading the virus, which, okay, I guess as a health measure, that makes sense, but it only makes sense if the government is going to step in and provide material support to replace the wages that people lose from not being able to go to work, and provide food and medicine that people would otherwise be procuring for themselves with their paychecks and, you know, helping the business owners out who are losing their livelihood too. But the government in this country did none of that. The government in this country just said, we're shutting businesses down to keep people from spreading the virus. And not only are you on your own as far as how you're going to survive, through this, but we're not even going to provide you PPE, masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer to keep you safe from the virus. So while we were angry, we, the working class and poor, the masses were mad as hell because we're, we don't have PPE, but we're getting criminalized and punished for not adhering to mask mandates and, you know, getting pulled off buses and fined and shit because we don't have a mask on trying to get to work on public transportation but no, nobody's providing us with a mask. The petit bourgeois, the business class, they're mad because their workers are gone and their income is gone. So it struck me how, and this might be a controversial thing for me to say, but that's okay. It's my show. I can say what I want. I would have had a tiny bit more respect for those folks. Even even with the white supremacy and the Nazi shit and the and the you know the anti-Semitism, because dude with the uh, camp Auschwitz, I'm like, okay, I, I don't know why that surprised people, but you know people were shocked and freaked out by it. I'm like, how how are you surprised that you get that many white people in one place and there's not going to be at least one guy who's, who's an anti-Semite? But okay, but I would have had a little tiny bit of a modicum of respect for them if they had gotten in there and somebody with a bullhorn said, hey, y'all, you know what? While we're in here, why don't we ask for some shit? <laughs> you, know? you know, they stormed the U.S. Capitol, were able to uh, uh, breach the, the House floor, no, it was the Senate floor, 
Um, and nobody said, you know what? We need Medicare for all. You know what? If you need to start delivering to us masks and say, you know, hand sanitizer and you need to pay people's rent and you need to make sure that people can get their prescriptions. But none of that, none of that. They just spread shit and piss all over the place and, <laughs> and, you know, hung off the balcony. And I mean, so it's like, to me, I feel like this thing was, I think it was a really good example of the lack of understanding of the class disconnection between these groups of people, right? Because I don't know about you all, um, Erica, I don't know if you've been seeing how some folks on the so-called left, and, and we got to deal with that general left term, because I don't even know what the hell that is anymore. Um, some folks on the so-called left saying that, you know, they, they agree with the, or they understand why these people are angry and, and why, while I, I have no dog in the fight about them tearing up the U.S. Capitol, there isn't anything else we agree on. But I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, how, how do you, how do you feel about that, Erica? How did you feel when you, when you realized that, you know, were you sitting there waiting for them to like roll out a list of demands? <laughs> yeah, I think the, the, the thing, the first thing I posted was like, uh, they did all that and we still only getting $600. Um, <laughs> so, you know, nothing significantly moved, no needle was moved for in either direction for anyone um, beyond that, uh, you know, except more, you know, repression <laughs> that happened. Um, but yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I really don't even understand the left. <laughs> Um, so, so I try and I try not to, um, I try not to understand them, um, because I, I think that they are a large part also responsible for a lot of the shit that we see in January 6th, um, just for their in inaction or the in inability to, to organize and, and study, um, what's actually happening and being just as reactionary as as the, as the so-called liberals that they despise um but yeah i don't really get how any of that really had anything to do with us in any facet um i do i do understand the criticism that we should be more mindful of saying it has nothing to do with us only because we should be, you know, actively paying attention to the shit that they're doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it had nothing to do with us. Um, <laughs> so it, 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 there was no fight involved for us. I mean, not even a demand, not even the intention behind it. I mean, the only places where we would unite is, you know, the destruction of, of the, the Capitol. And, you know, everyone hates Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> right, right. You know, that's a unifying thing. But but outside of that, no, um, there's no there's no unifying point for me. Anya, what about you? I mean, I agree. Those people were not, someone said, put it very clearly in the chat, those people were not workers. That's why they didn't care about a big stimulus or Medicare for all. Even though, like, you would think if they had, like, critical thinking skills, they'd be like, hey, if my worker can have health care, <laughs> it'll be better for me in the long run because they can go back to work. But they don't care. They have no long-term planning skills, and they have no class consciousness. So they weren't going to be asking for things that were going to help the majority of people because they themselves are not impacted. They were just worried about getting a haircut. Then they know them. <laughs> but I will say one thing that was interesting for me is how they turned on the police. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's where I was going next. <laughs> because it's like, you know, like the whole Blue Lives Matter, thin blue line, like aligning with the police thing has kind of been a feature of the far right until quite recently. Like the Proud Boys started fighting them in the streets in Portland once the police started cracking down on them. And then we saw this escalation on the 6th where now it seems the far right is breaking with the police. It's openly antagonistic to them. So who is the section of U.S. society that fucks with the police now? I kind of think that's a positive development as the yeah. police are being discredited that more and more people across the spectrum are like, we're not into y'all. Regardless if it's coming from reaction your place or not, I was into the cops getting beat with the flag. I was lit. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Erica. I was going to say, I'll tell you the section that's into the police, and that's the damn liberals and the Democrats, the Joy Reeds and such, who are calling that black police officer a hero. 
Oh, I bring him to the real Black Panther. So yeah, those oh, uh-uh. people who like the police at Clyburn. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Grandpappy Jim Clyburn, really with his, with his. I I am I I think that um I believe that making the uh uh the the, the Black National an- Anthem lift every voice and sing a national hymn and getting us all to sing it together, I guess like that Coca-Cola commercial back in there. Remember that commercial, I like to teach the world to sing? Yeah. I guess if we all do that, he actually introduced that as, he's actually talking about introducing that as um, some type of, of legislation as a way to heal America. And I swear to God, Uncle Grandpappy Jim Clyburn, as my mama used to say, that Negro makes my teeth itch. (laughs) <laughs> and I, and I, I, I just I feel like what we're what what we're seeing what you just said, Erica, the liberals and and the Democrats lionizing the cops like they are. And I wish I had this picture up, and I, I don't have it on on me. I don't have it handy right now. Um, maybe I can find it on Facebook. But there is um, a whole bunch of lionizing of the cops on you know that's being done by the democrats and and you know folks who don't know better would be like well you know the cops were heroes especially that black cop who saved them all from you know that crazy racist mob um but no um that man is being used by the Democrats, as are the rest of the cops, but especially the black cops are being used by the Democrats very, very cynically to prop up this argument that is surely going to come. And I think you all mentioned it earlier about why we can't defund the police. Because, you know, you, I can almost hear Joe Biden saying, you know, you know, I'm, I, I, I know that that there are problems with the police and we need more accountability. But you saw at, at, at the Capitol on, on January 6th why we can't defund the police. Imagine what would have happened if the Capitol Police had been defunded. Now, mm-hmm. <clears throat> never mind that there were plenty of cops and military in the crowd of fascists. So, I mean, them having all the money in the world didn't stop that shit, but that's not going to matter to the argument that's going to come from the Democrats about what happened on January 6th. And in particular, what they did, what this white supremacist mob, because, you know, they can say white supremacy now and feel pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. Um, what this white supremacist mob did to our brave officers, especially this black cop, this is why we can't defund the police. Uh, Anya, am I off course? Am I off track? Or do you see it coming too? I see it coming. And the sad part is, is that Joe Biden was already very transparent about the moves he's going to make in terms of giving hundreds of millions of dollars in additional funding to the police in in terms of tightening the surveillance state particularly at the U.S. border, but also in inner city communities. Like, Joe Biden was already planning to expand the U.S. security state. That's why he picked Susan Rice for that domestic policy position. That's why he picked Kamala Harris as his vice president. Like, this was already in the works. But the unfortunate thing now is that what the January 6th has created the bipartisan consensus for this to happen. So that you're going to see, you know, the petty bourgeois misleadership class of Africans um, uniting behind this. People like Jim Clyburn, people like the, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus. Even you even see the squad uniting behind this 30 security state language and the expansion of the surveillance state in the United States. So what's happening now is what Joe Biden was always intending to do, except now everybody's into it. And they're propping up that African cop as an example of how funding the police is funding a diverse workforce full of colonized people that we need to support. It's just the expansion of neocolonialism. It's the expansion of the weaponization of identity policy. It's very, yeah, dark time. Yeah, and and I mean, I'm I'm actually remembering like a few summers ago, we we went to support the uh, HU Resist on uh, Howard University campus. And we just happened to go there the day that, no, we didn't happen to go there. They called us and they told us, 
hey, did you know James Comey is speaking here? here. Um, we're going to have a protest. And we're like, oh, word? No, we got to come see what goes on. So HU Resist uh, uh, um, uh, um, organization, radical organization on Howard University campus, they were protesting James Comey, Comey, former FBI director who was speaking on the campus of Howard University, the Mecca, you know, uh, uh, penultimate, well, not penultimate, that's the wrong word, uh, 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 beacon of, of, of HBCU, you know, education and probably churns out the most doc, black doctors in the country. Um, why was he speaking there? Because he was uh, the visiting fellow for their, uh, they have this visiting fellow program and the person who is the visiting fellow teaches for two years. On the, James Comey, the former head of the FBI, was a visiting fellow on the campus of Howard University. And, and what did the campus cops at, H, at, at, at Howard University do? Kindly escorted those young black radicals out of that auditorium. So the 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 uh, uh, class of young black kids who are groomed into accepting neoliberalism and imperialist policies could sit there and soak up the knowledge from James Comey so they could create this diverse uh, uh, workforce in the U.S. security and imperialist state. I mean, it's it's crazy yeah. how, you know, it, uh, Anya, go ahead. Did you did y'all see the the ad that the CIA put out with the with the sister? Talking no. About, yes, it was on Twitter. It posted an image of an African woman with natural hair with a new logo, a new brand, talking about we're trying to recruit and diversify the CIA, the CIA that is responsible for the assassinations and the overthrow of so many African figures and movements. Like they are trying to diversify the U.S. imperialist state, and people are going to go, like, be, who, do you really think, like, BLM, the movement for Black Lives, is going to oppose that? Do you wow. really think that the folks, the petty bourgeois African media, are going to impose that? They're not. They're not even anti-imperialist. No. So it's, like, yeah. very wild to watch this, un to watch the rehabilitation of the CIA and the FBI and, like, the U.S. security state. Like, it's, it's really incredible how they are moving to do this, how they're moving to diversify to entrench their power. Yeah. That is crazy. Erica, go ahead. No, I want to, and I'm glad you mentioned and shout out to HU Resist. A lot of them graduated, the, the ones that I knew, um, but great comrades still. Um, but I'm glad that you mentioned James Comey because, again, James Comey is largely responsible for Black identity extremism, uh, that list, um, and the 1033 program. He's the yeah. one that introduced it as, as something favorable. I always talk about that documentary, Do Not Resist, that sort of lays yeah. and on like plain. Um, but yeah, he, he, he had a lot to do with that. And to see the acceptance of this man um, it just all that just further shows the ways that we are walked into these narratives where these things are ingrained into to being normalized and, and to being accepted. Um, because again, with the militarized policing, the, the my issues with the squad has always been specifically um, Cortez, uh, Ascaria Cortez. Um, you know, not only is she like a charlatan, uh, but besides that, um, even with in her defense of the people, right? In her mm -hmm. argument, she she makes it very plain that she doesn't even really understand what she's arguing for in a sense that it, it's of no benefit. Like the back and forth uh, with uh, Nikki Haley about defunding police. She says that policing is a municipal issue and not a federal one. Which gives them that you know, so that gives them the opening to not even address federal funding of policing, which they never intended to do, especially when they put on the Kente clause. That's the first thing Nancy Pelosi said that they have to redirect the funding to state because that's the state issue. So they're never going to talk about 1033, they're never going to talk mm -hmm. about deadly exchange, they're never going to talk about Operation Relentless Pursuit, and now they don't have to <laughs> because now they, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm so glad you, I'm sorry, no, go ahead on you. I just want to say, I don't think that's intentional or like just confusion on the part of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I think that's very, very, very intentional. Because if you watch what's happening right now, you know, we're having this conversation about how this, 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 what happened on January 6th is being used for the expansion of the security state. And what is AOC talking about right now? 
not about the proposed counterterrorism measures, which we already know are going to be used against social justice movements. AOC is talking about the second doomed impeachment. That's her whole feat. She has no analysis whatsoever about what Biden is proposing in terms of policing and counterterrorism and security. She's only talking about this spectacle. All AOC has ever existed to do is redirect radical energy back into the state, back into the Democratic Party. She runs interference for the security state and for imperialism. She always has. Eric is the one that points that out to me from the very beginning, and now I see it. I'm like, girl, you're supposed to be progressive, and you have no concerns whatsoever about the expansion of the security. Mm. That's cool. <laughs> right, exactly. And, <laughs> right, and and that was the cry. I remember when when people criti criticized Uncle Bernie Sanders <clears throat> about his imperialism, and people lost their minds. But there is no way that we call ourselves struggling for our liberation in the belly of the beast, in the beating heart of imperialism, and then we don't care what happens to the victims of imperialism. That's fucking insane to me. But this is, I think, a part of the problem with the so-called left and definitely with progressives. I, I'm not even sure what that means. I don't think they understand what that means. I feel like progressives just think that progressivism is just Medicare for all and, you know, achieving Medicare for all and, and college tuition uh, forgiveness, which are important. But that's not what leftism is and it sure isn't what radical leftism is i have this <clears throat> go I ahead clip that i always say like asada shakur um you know in her book she says that liberal is the most useless word in the dictionary oh and i say yeah. that, you know they all read that book and decided to call themselves progressives instead like you know so now they don't want to be attached to liberalism so right everyone's a progressive but that doesn't mean shit either like <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> So I, I did find this picture, just 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 um, going with the cop thing, and, and I don't know if, if you can see that really well, <clears throat> but this is the D.C. cop that is being uh, interviewed all over CNN, Michael Fanon, he's a D.C. MPD, and I saw this like this morning when I was having my coffee. I, I get up, you know, talk to my ancestors, say nice things to my husband and have my coffee. Actually, I have to have coffee first before I can say nice things to anybody. And he understands that because he's the exact same way. We don't talk to each other. We say like, hey, had a good night? Great. You making coffee? Okay. <laughs> and then we come back and have a conversation after coffee. But we're sitting there and we're watching this. And <clears throat> I hope this picture is clear. And I don't know, maybe I'm just showing my age. But does anybody else notice something really fucked up about this dude's picture? <laughs> I think I seen it when you posted it about the spider web. I mean, back in in the day, a white dude with a spider web tattooed on him anywhere meant he's been in the joint and he is a member of some white supremacist organization and he's killed someone. Now, I mean, people can make all kinds of meanings that they want out of tattoos these days and he looks kind of young, so maybe he doesn't even mean know what the tattoo means. But it sure is odd to me that he was being interviewed repeatedly. That just, they just kept showing all these clips over and over and over again of this guy. So they interviewed, for him, interviewed him for a long time and nobody, nobody noticed, hey, what's going on with that tattoo? Maybe you should cover it up. And, and I, I don't know. I, I, just, I just feel like this picture of this DC cop is indicative of everything that we know is wrong with law enforcement, but everything that we really just don't want to admit. I mean, it's like, yeah, we know there's a bunch of white supremacists in the police force in the military, but let's not say anything about it. And then we get all crazy when you know they actually kill a bunch of people. Not, not saying that we shouldn't, but there's no way that man should be on television. Right giving interviews and nobody is like, how are y'all interviewing that man and calling him a hero? He needs to explain that damn tattoo. <laughs> right. I think people think the cops and the clan go hand in hand. It's just a catchy jingle and not like what's really <laughs> happening. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the, the whole thing is crazy. And I think, 
ultimately, and I, I want to go backward to end, you know, to kind of wrap this up before I give you guys the floor and give, you know, your general thoughts on where we go from here. Um, because, you know, look, like I said, D.C. is downtown. D.C. is shut down. There are 25,000 military personnel, National Guard, regular, you know, active duty or whatever. And they are armed uh, here. Um, so we can't move around in in the city that we live in, that we pay taxes in, but we were already occupied over here in the hood anyway. So, you know, that's actually all the white people are freaked out about, you know, all the military all over the place and all the black people are like, well, this is Tuesday. What's I mean, <laughs> you know, if you go up to go up to the street, the gas station right now, I bet you there are five cop cars sitting at the gas station up in the corner. Um I wanted to ask both of you your feelings about this whole election thing, because I have many thoughts, but this one time I'm going to keep them to myself. <laughs> and, you know, all of this kicked off because people were convinced about a stolen election. Um, and I didn't really keep my thoughts to myself. I've expressed them. <clears throat> I think it's kind of difficult for the Democrats to have clean hands in this discussion when we know that they have dealt Bernie Sanders dirty in the primaries. But at the same time, the same people who are yelling and screaming about, oh my God, you stole the election, didn't give a shit about actual voter suppression that the GOP has committed on a massive scale, um, like to the tune of like 30, almost 40 million people denied the so-called right to vote. Um, I don't know what, what do you, what, where do you guys weigh in on this whole discussion about whether the election was stolen or not, or is it even something that we should even be bothered with? Um, I feel like at this point, I think that we should, well, first of all, for me, I, I will say that I don't take much seriousness into the idea of voter suppression. Not that I don't take it as a material existing thing, but I do think that voter suppression is like the go-to bad for the Democratic Party, right? When they feel like something slipping away at their grass, they scream voter suppression, and then they can get people to come out in droves because it's not like they're actually doing anything within those that time lot to actually, you know, address voter suppression, at least the electoral college for the, you know, Biden is still okay, okay with it. He's still in support of the electoral college. Um, but I think, I think that for my frustration is not so much the election, but elections and, and how it distracts, um, from actual organizing and the things that we need to be focused on in the midst of what the government, uh, intends to do. Uh, because I, I feel like we're trapped in elections like it's never ending. There's the primary and the off year and then there's like the you know <laughs> then there's the general election. Um, you know, and, and uh you know every two years there's an election. I feel like we're trapped in a never ending cycle where we can't break out of that and where we have people, you know, convinced. Um like uh no name tweeted that she doesn't know any socialists that would um run in an imperialist party and people are like freaking out because for them, Cori Bush said she was a socialist, right? But mm -hmm. nobody has to like actually address the contradictions of that party that exists, you know, an imperialist party. It's a right wing neoliberal party. Um, so you know, being a socialist within that party means what? What does that mean? And what has it meant? What has it meant for AOC calling herself one? Like, <laughs> you know, um, and I don't think that anyone is actually um really looking at least for on the left i think there's too much fixation on elections or ways to get into the two-party system and not so much about building the actual power needed for your vote to even matter you know if we're going to deal with voter suppression what is the voter suppression if we don't even have power as black voters mm. um so yeah so for me i, I you know i think that we are a, maybe a little past that question. I, I also don't think that we would ever get beyond dealing with elections if we don't like detach <laughs> from actual, like, you know, the, the continuous cycle. And how do we do that? Uh oh, it looks like Anya uh, disappeared for a second. We hope to get her back. There she is. There you are. So, uh, yep. <laughs> oh, you're mute. So Anya, what, what do you, what do you think? 
Can you repeat the question? I froze for like a solid minute. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, th there's, you know, the all of this happened last week because of an allegedly stolen election. Um, and, you know, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on, you know, how much attention we should be paying to this argument about whether the election was stolen or not, um, considering that both parties are, their hands are dirty in regard to um, disenfranchising people's so-called right to vote. The Democrats have done it in the primaries. The Republicans have done it uh, with voter suppression, gerrymandering, and all kinds of other crap, especially keeping Black people, uh, Black poor people, pe uh, other people of color, um, you know, uh, 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 Indigenous people, um, uh, uh, Chicanos, uh, away as 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 many of those folks. Uh, um, um, not allowed to vote for whatever reason the, the GOP could come up with to make sure that fewer of those folks voted. So they're, you know, racist ass politicians that only, uh, you know, older white people will vote for uh, have a chance at winning. I mean, considering that both parties are pretty much, they've got dirty hands in this, in this argument. Uh, and, you know, we are talking about a system and not an election that we're fighting. How much is this something that we should be paying all that much attention to, this this argument about a stolen election? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I fully agree. There hasn't been a free and fair election in the United States for a very, very long time. What national elections are is just a, a contest between two different sectors of the ruling class with the sheen of giving regular people a choice when in reality, everybody involved is like pre-selected by the folks of power. So yeah. there's no such thing as a free and fair election in a bourgeois democracy. Um, these people do not represent our interests. They represent the interests of the ruling class. They represent the interests of these corporations. They represent the interests of the wealthy. They do not re represent the interests of African and colonized people. So in terms of like, if the, like clearly it wasn't stolen, clearly it's just Trump, you know, building his long-term political brand, building the reactionary movement around him. That's obvious, but also I don't care. Joe Biden is as proto-fascist as Trump. Mm. None of these people, I don't care which one of them sits in that seat. It does not matter to us because we don't actually have power within that system. What African people need to be focused on is building independent political organizations, building independent political power, like Ujima People's Progress Party, mm -hmm. like Black Alliance for Peace, mm -hmm. like the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We need to be focused on building institutions of community defense so that when this security state clap back, comes down that we are prepared to defend ourselves that we are prepared to protect our communities we need to be focused on building movements that we control and elevating political figures that are accountable to us we don't need to like be engaged in these games between two dueling factions of rich white people that's not our business like let them fight among out amongst themselves i know some people who are planning to to protest the inauguration I'm like, that is not like, what does that have to do with us? <laughs> to protest and protect American democracy? For what? For what? Like, let those white people fight amongst themselves. Let the vigilante pigs fight the official pigs. Like, let them just worry about that and let us build what we need to survive what's coming. Let us build what we need to survive what's coming. I don't care about which party controls the bourgeois democracy. We need to tear it down and build something better that we actually control. Amen. Amen. I mean, it's funny because when it happened, my dad called me. Um, and he's just like, are you down there? I'm like, dad, this is right on right crime. Why would I go down there and mess with those people in between their little family fight? I'm not, this ain't got nothing to do with me. Now it, it's true that, you know, these are the people who, if they had a chance, they would kill us. They, they absolutely would. So in that regard, yes, we do have to pay attention to what they're doing. Um, and, and, what is going to happen uh, on in the days leading up to the inauguration, the people who are going to come into the city and who've been here, because I think a whole lot of people just haven't left, um, and what they're going to do um, in regard to, and, and how it's going to, you know, if it's going to affect our people over here, yeah, that, that matters to me. But whether these people, like this whole, you know, these people talking about, oh, they, they violated the sacredness of the U.S. Capitol. Sacred to who? That no, There is nothing in there that is sacred to me. The building is not sacred. The, I mean, the, the, the ideals that the Capitol stands for 
not sacred. Nothing that goes on in that building has ever benefited African people in this country or around the world or indigenous people or poor people, working class and poor people. The U.S. Capitol is the symbol not of American democracy, but of U.S. imperialism. That's what it's the symbol of. That is what it is a symbol of. So in that regard, yeah, I'm I'm completely not concerned about what happens at the Capitol. And I think it's almost like poetic justice that some of the legislators are literally like afraid of the other legislators now <laughs> because they've let, like the GOP has let the Tea Party grow into this like monster of Trump supporters um, and now they are bringing their guns onto the, onto like the House and the Senate floor, which you can't do. And, you know, now they're afraid that these crazy Trump supporters who just got elected, which is really weird because the very people who just voted against certifying the election were people who just won an election that they said was stolen. I, I just realized that. <laughs> I'm going to have to have a glass of wine on that because I don't even think they understood. I don't even think they understand how ridiculous they sound, how illogical they are. But it logic isn't the point. Justice isn't the point. Democracy sure is not the point because the United States destroys democracies. The United States has been actively trying to destroy the democracy in Venezuela and in Cuba and in Brazil and, and around the world. And, and I mean, so as far as like our material, our physical safety is concerned, yes, I'm concerned about what happens at the US Capitol um, cause it ain't that far from here. But as far as like the, the, the policy outcomes and, and you know, what it means for the myth of America, I don't care. I, I, I it is not something that I don't think that we should should spend a whole lot of time agonizing about oh what does this mean for the for for America the concept of America I, I think tonight you all have helped me parse out the things that we really do need to pay attention to um, that will be fallout from this the expanding security state that's going to come from a Democrat not only a Democratic White House but a Democratic majority in the White House in the house and in the Senate. They are they're not they don't need bipartisan support to pass uh the Patriot Act 5.0, which is coming. They they're going to do it. They're letting you know they're going to do it. Um so I'm going to give the two of you the floor to say whatever you have to say to wrap this conversation up where you want to leave what you want to leave with people. Um you know what what we need to be doing beyond inauguration. I think the most important thing is that people stop, need to stop being surprised that this is how the present is developing in the United States. Because if you look at how this history was founded, if you look at how European settler colonialism developed, if you look at how the US became an empire, um, white supremacist fascist behavior was like the foundation of that growth, you know? So like, even the, the whole question of the US military being so-called infiltrated by white supremacists, I'm like when the US military occupied Haiti for like 15 years and lynched thousands of people, what was that if not white supremacy? And that was like in the 20th, like in the early 20th century, right? So this has like been the consistent behavior of the US empire for its entire existence. There was never a point when the United States as an entity was not white supremacist, was not actively genocidal towards African and indigenous and colonized peoples. Once you understand that, you understand that there's no working with this. There's no like finding like the right representative within the, the settler state and figuring it out how to change it from the inside. Like there's nothing, there's never going to be anything but fascism within the U.S. empire as an entity, which means that we as African people, as colonized peoples need to build independent political power, need to build independent political organizations with the ultimate objective of revolution. We must be actively organizing in organizations, building a movement to overthrow this, to overturn this, because the long-term plan for the folks in power within the United States is to let us die from catastrophic climate change, from escalating global pandemics, and from the collapse of capitalism. 
There is no plan for our survival built into this entity. And so understanding that we need to stop trying to negotiate with it. We need to stop like, like finding like heroes within it. We need to stop thinking that we can integrate into this burning house. And instead we need to build our own shit. Like that's it, just give it up. Give it up. Stop trying to try to stand to the U.S. for the inside. Like jump from this sinking ship for the love of God, because it's going down. It's going down. Please build your own independent political movement. <laughs> here, 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 Erica. Yeah, no, only is like the best, right? Like, how, what do I follow up with? But no, <laughs> but no, I think for me, I do, I do want to like hammer home the idea that, like, again, imperialism is not a buzzword, trendy issue, and. Too many people are treating it like such online and online spaces. Um, of course, we know that these people are, are typically not tied to any organization. These are just individuals. But the the, the idea is that, um, especially as Africans, that we can't continue the apathy um, against you know imperialism that's happening because we also have to make these connections that imperialism is not some off the way happening out there. When I stress the point about the 1033 and militarized policing is that because that's what imperialism looks like domestically. Mm -hmm. And if we're not challenging them on any of it and we're accepting all of it, you know, what does that mean for us? Um, not it, what does that mean for the global fight of African liberation? Um, you know, so we cannot continue to internalize these things and, and keep this sort of Western U.S. Uh, within the empire sort of lens on socialism, right? Because that is not socialism. If you don't have any internationalism in your politics, then what the hell, what is, what's the point, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and also, like, if you're going to be anti-police, then you should damn well be anti-imperialist, <laughs> you know? So, you know, and but again, these are concepts and ideas that is why we're <coughs> Join an organization, join a revolutionary organization that encourages political education, that encourages work study, that encourages struggling with ideas so that you can, you know, say these things and understand these things when you say them, you know, when you're having these conversations, because you're going to run into, again, like you, you mentioned Kwame Ture um, in the beginning of this, you know, everybody's not coming into, you know, we're not born a revolutionary. We have to come into that. We have to read, study and all of that. But then also to Kwame Ture's, um, you know, brilliance. I'm also the mindset like, you know, fuck that too. The class str struggle got to be, the, you know, <laughs> a ruthless fucking struggle. And we have to like cut next if we have to. Like we cannot continue to allow people to allow others to be walked into these narratives. You know, we have to challenge the black funded class. So the Joy Reads and such. We have to challenge the black misleadership class. We have to challenge the squad. And we have to challenge that whole idea that change happens within that party. It does not, and it has never happened for any of us within that party. So Erica, where can people find your work, your stuff, and what organi organization should they be looking into to join? Um, so I mentioned Eugene with People's Progress Party. That's the independent black workers led political party. Oh. So again, when we talk about building uh, you know, black power outside of the two party system. That is what Ujima is, is basically trying to do and accomplish in Maryland. Um, so you can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, um, Eugenia People's Progress Party, I believe, dot org. And then uh, Black Lions for Peace, of course, is blacklionsforpeace.com. It's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, tap in, become a member. If you're African, um, donate. <laughs> support, uh, you know, and then I also want to sh uh, shout out the, the campaigns of No Compromise and the Retreat and um, Shut Down AFRICOM because those are two really major important campaigns. You can find that there. And then Hood Communists, of course, is on Twitter causing a ruckus. And <laughs> on Facebook and uh, Instagram. And of course, you can read all the articles that are from Africans across the globe. We're getting Africans writing in from the continent, from Europe, from uh, Latin America, from Canada. Yeah. So um, we're really, really proud of the success of the blog thus far. You can find that at hoodcommunist.org. You can sign up for the newsletter. Um, yeah. Oh, and Liberation for Reading. And you can find us on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And you can buy a book for a Black child. You know, if you don't want to support Amazon, you could just directly donate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it was funny watching that um, join an organization tweet, and 
how people lost their mind with that. That that was hilarious to me. It's like, really? Y'all are that? Okay. <laughs> but Anya, what about you? Where can people find your work? Uh, and what organizations, uh, what organization, where can they find your organization if they want to look into it? Uh, also, Hood Communist, part of the editorial team. Definitely check out the blog, new articles every single Thursday. From a revolutionary African perspective, we only have African writers. I feel like we don't get the credit we deserve for having only African writers from all around the world, most of whom are active organizers speaking directly from Speak what they're experiencing on the ground. Speak so, it. Mm -hmm. Not going to get that in many places. Read hoodcommunist.org. Also, I am a cadre of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We are a revolutionary pan-African socialist party building independent political power for African people. Our political objective is pan-Africanism, one unified socialist Africa, because we understand that our destiny is not in the United Snakes. It is not in the US empire. We are made Americans against our will. Our home is Africa. Our land is Africa. Our resources are in Africa and our future is in Africa. And so we are trying to organize the entire diaspora, all people of African descent, around that objective of Pan-Africanism, because once Africa is free, African people everywhere will be free. Mm -hmm. This empire should not be allowed to loot Africans' resources to use them to exploit African people. No, we should control our own resources collectively. So check out the AAPRP, aaprp-intl.org is where you can check us out. My chapter is the New Mexico chapter, aaprp newmexico.org. And then also uh, internationalism, is a extremely important component of the struggle for African liberation. Just like Erica said, we cannot be apathetic to US imperialism. All the tactics that the US government uses, all the tactics the US empire uses to brutalize colonized peoples in Africa around the world, always come back home to hit us, to hit colonized people within the empire. So we have to make those connections. And to that end, I am an active member of the Cuba Solidarity Movement, specifically with the Benson Amos Brigade. Folks can learn about it at bbforcuba.com. But right now, the U.S. empire is attacking the Cuban revolution. Yeah. Cuba is sending doctors yeah. all around the world to fight COVID and save lives. And in response, the U.S. government is tightening the economic blockade and trying to strangle Cuba's economy, while also falsely accusing Cuba of terrorism. And we've already talked in depth about this show. When the U.S. throws accusations of terrorism around, um, repression follows. And so it's a really mm -hmm. important time to show up for Cuba. So please check out bbforcuba.com. Follow the Benson Emma's Brigade on Twitter and also take the time to learn the truth about Cuba so you can counter oh, some of these lies yeah. that the U.S. government is spreading to attack it. I mean, this has been like this has been one of the best hour and a half of this of my week. I just I, I've wanted I've been waiting to have this conversation for a week with y'all because I knew that y'all would come correct with the analysis and and be very clear about what our focus should be. So I want to thank you so much, Erica, and Onya Sanwu for joining me today. Thank you all so much for your time, for your passion, for your brilliance, for your work. And I am sure some shit's going to pop off in the empire again, where we're going to have to get together and 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 figure it out one more time. So I, I would love to have you back on um, uh, in the very near future. But in the meantime, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for your time today. Y'all are dope. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, y'all. And thank y'all so much for watching. Y'all have been chopping it up in the comments. We love you so much. Support Black Alliance for Peace, Ujima People's Progress Party, the All African People's Progress Party. Uh, I mean, support Black revolutionary radical organizations. Support us here in Luke Mon Nation. If you like what you see, like what you hear, share our content and become a patron. Um, if you are able to, with regular support, three, five, seven dollars a month, you can find us on patreon.com slash Luke Bond Nation, L U Q M A N N A T I O N. As always, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, like us on uh, Facebook. And as always, we've been saying this for a long time, and it, it really, really means everything right now. I say to you, peace, if you are willing to fight for it, and we are having to fight for it now. Y'all take care of yourselves. Peace. Or well, whatever. <laughs>
up and they on top when I'm a mile up. I had a all line before I dial up. How they claim and they on top when I'm a mile up. Uh, I know the wall's closing in, but don't you dare give up now. Hope believe, let me pull up through some bucks down. Tired till the valet pull the truck round. Push the line up that we drew it, it's just us now. Would you believe me if I told you my granny told me she prayed this? Then booked the surgery just to pull me out of the basement. Right back where I started, nothing to show for a facelift. Got pushed playing Walter White and Davis, never felt so dangerous. The 